Welcome to the ABCs of Kidney Disease. I'm Daphne Nicely. I'm one of the nephrologists here at Hopkins. This is our reoccurring monthly education class that we offer to the community, to our patients, and to those with kidney disease or those just interested to learn about kidney disease. This class will be run by myself and my colleague, Dr. Sutha Varaja. So I'm going to be doing the first half and she'll do the second half, so we'll switch off. Just a little bit about this program. So this is just one of our classes. It falls under the Johns Hopkins Nephrology Patient Education Program. We also offer classes on nutrition. We have a class um, on uh, several webinars on transplant or on home dialysis. And then we also have a half day conference we offer in the fall. And we offer classes throughout the entire year, so stay tuned. So the way this class is organized is at the beginning of the class, I'll talk a little bit about what normal kidney function is. Then I'll go into the causes of kidney disease and the stages. And then we'll talk about how kidney disease affects the body. And this is where I talk about myself, like as a nephrologist, what I'm looking for whenever I talk to you in clinic, do a physical exam or look at your labs. At that point, I'll switch over to Dr. Thevaraja, who will talk to you about you know, what is, what do we do when the kidneys completely stop working? Like, what do we do to try to manage that kidney disease? And then also, what are our options regarding dialysis and transplantation? So just to talk to you a little bit about your kidneys. So your kidneys are basically the size of your fist, and they sit in your mid-back, kind of where halfway covered by your ribs and half not. And they have little tubes going from your kidneys to your bladder. Those are called your ureters. And then from your bladder out, that's called your urethra. And for men, that urethra goes through the prostate. So that's why we ask you about your prostate function. So what do the kidneys do? So the kidneys actually do a lot of different things. Um, and this makes my job interesting. So they help manage water in the body. They help balance it. So if I was in the Mojave Desert with no access to water. My kidneys would recognize, hey, I need to conserve as much water as possible. So I might pee maybe like a teaspoon just to get rid of tox toxins. Or if I joined a radio contest and I drank 10 gallons of water, which you should not do, um, my body would recognize I don't need any of this water but a cup of it, so I'm gonna pee out the rest and I'd be in the bathroom all day. The kidneys are also the chemist of the body. So they help balance our chemistries. Things like our sodium, potassium, chloride, phosphorus, calcium. We need these kind of elements for our body to function normally. And they help keep it at the right level. They're also the washing machine of the body. So they help with removing toxins and drugs and things out of our body. So we naturally create toxins just by our, our body doing work. Um, so the kidneys help get rid of that. And you know, we also develop toxins whenever with the medications we take or what we eat, and the kidneys help get rid of that as well. Now, sometimes people forget that the kidneys are important for hormones, like they respond to hormones, they make hormones, um, all for important functions. So they respond to hormones to help control blood pressure. You know, my blood pressure is low, they respond to hormones to hold on to water and sodium to raise my blood pressure or they, the kidneys make a hormone that helps you know, tell the bone marrow to make red blood cells. Then they also respond by kind of balancing calcium and phosphorus and making vitamin D into the working forms to help make strong bones. And I'm gonna go into those a little bit um, in more detail later on in the presentation. So what is kidney disease exactly? So kidney disease, it can have a lot of different names, a lot of different forms. You can call it kidney disease, kidney failure, kidney injury. They all mean the same thing. Um, basically, the kidneys just don't do the job they're supposed to. They're not getting rid of waste. They're not balancing the water. They're not balancing the chemistries like they should. And we just kind of give it the name of kidney disease. And there are several types. We're gonna focus mainly on chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease in this talk, but I wanted to mention acute kidney injury or acute kidney failure. This is something like, I had normal kidney function today and then I get in a car wreck tonight and I bleed enough that, you know, drops my blood pressure, my kidneys get injured. You know, all the organ systems are gonna get injured, including my kidneys. And at that moment, that injury took my kidneys from normal function to not working great. And that's what we call acute kidney injury. And there are a lot of different forms that can cause this. It can be from drops in blood pressure, you know, blood loss. 
And these are usually patients that we see in the hospital a lot. Now, when somebody has something called acute kidney injury, it can be reversible. So, you know, I restore that person's blood pressure or I stop the bleeding. You know, they're going to have an injury for a little bit. Um, hopefully it recovers back to normal. Um, it might recover almost back to normal with a little kidney disease. Or, you know, there are some people that it doesn't recover. But we see them in the hospital and we try to help them through it. Now, chronic kidney disease is a little different. Um, it's basically a really slow loss of kidney function. And the actual definition is it has to be more than three months, be present for more than three months, but it's kind of the slow loss where the kidneys kind of are slowly losing their ability to filter, slowly losing their ability to um, get rid of water like they should or balance the chemistries. Now, it can progress all the way to completely stopping. You know, my job as a kidney doctor is hopefully to slow that progression so that it doesn't develop into kidney failure or the needing dialysis. And the other thing to know about chronic kidney disease is there's actually five stages. And I'm going to talk about those in a minute because it's important for me to know because I can help, you know, determine how often I need to see someone or how often they need to get labs. Now, when someone has complete loss of kidney function, and, you know, it's total permanent loss, then that's, we give it a name called end-stage renal disease or end-stage kidney disease. And it's really those folks um, we give this kind of label to those folks that are on dialysis. So, you know, just to talk a little bit about the numbers for chronic kidney disease, actually a lot of people have chronic kidney disease. It's like 37 million adults in the United States have it, and that's new numbers from this past year. One in eight are in Maryland have chronic kidney disease, and one in three adults are at risk for kidney disease. Now, you know, most of the time people don't even know they have kidney disease. They really need to lose 90% of their function before they ever get a single symptom of kidney disease. So this is really important for us as nephrologists because we do a lot of education for primary care doctors, you know, telling them who they need to look at for kidney disease because a lot of times before you lose all that function, we're only gonna pick it up on labs. You're never gonna have a symptom. So we talk to them about, you know, looking at people that are at high risk for get, getting chronic kidney disease. So it's folks with diabetes, high blood pressure, um, family history of kidney disease, being over the age of 65, obesity, um, also certain ethnic groups, kidney disease runs higher in. So African Americans, Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, all of those groups we look at. So with those folks and for screening for kidney disease and how we diagnose it, we, it's really two ways. So there's a urine test and there's a blood test. So the urine test, we call it a urinalysis. Um, sometimes we'll get more specific and look at like a urine albumin creatinine ratio or urine protein creatinine ratio, but typically it's urine analysis or urine dipstick. And what it's doing is it's looking for things in your urine that shouldn't be there, like blood or protein. So blood and protein are kind of big molecules they really shouldn't be in your urine. They're supposed to stay in the blood. So I like to use analogies. So if you think about the kidneys like a strainer for pasta, and pasta is your protein in your blood, really the pasta shouldn't fall through the strainer unless there's damage to your strainer. Then you'll have pasta falling in the sink when you rinse it off. This is kind of similar to the kidneys. So if I have damage to the kidneys, I might have, you know, red blood cells or protein falling into the urine and I pick it up on a urine analysis. And a lot of times I'll have the urine test pick up early kidney disease before I ever have blood chemistry changes. So the blood chemistry that I look at is creatinine. So creatinine is basically a waste product from our muscles. We naturally generate it and their kidneys help pee it out so they get rid of it. So you know the normal value for your blood test is about 1.2 or less. So if my kidneys aren't working, they're not getting rid of it through my urine, it's gonna go up in my blood. So the creatinine will increase in my blood values. Now, if we think about it, not everybody has the same amount of muscle mass. So if I have a lady who's in her 90s, she doesn't, she doesn't have much muscle mass. And I have a 20-year-old linebacker with tons of muscles they're both gonna be generating creatinine at a different rate. So let's say I check blood on them, and they both have a creatinine in their blood of one. 
Well, that sounds normal because normal is less than 1.2. But looking at them, I can tell that, well, that lady with in her 90s with not much muscle mass, really hers should probably be a lot lower. She shouldn't be generating that much creatinine. Whereas my 20 year old bodybuilder, the linebacker, he probably should have, his kidneys are working overtime to keep them, keep the creatinine in the normal range. So instead of me just like looking at the people and guessing, I look at something called our glomerular filtration rate or GFR. So if you look at your labs, you might see something labeled like either GFR or EGFR. This is what I'm talking about. This really means how many milliliters per minute my kidney of blood, my kidneys are filtering. And it's actually a better measure for kidney function. And on your labs, it's actually a calculated value. I'm not actually putting a probe in your kidney and measuring how much blood your kidneys are filtering. But what it does is it takes into account your age, your race, your gender, and your creatinine level to calculate how many milliliters per minute your, um, your kidneys are filtering of your blood. And this is a really better measure for your kidney function. So just to talk a little bit more about that. So as I said, this is probably, this is a measure of how well your kidneys are filtering. And it's probably a better measure of your kidney function. Normal is more than 90, usually about 100. Um, you know, and as you get older, this glomerular filtration rate is going to decrease. So, you know, a brand new car is not going to work the same in 20 years. Same thing for your kidneys. But there's a lot of redundancy in the kidney. And the kidneys can do a whole lot of work with a lower GFR or glomerular filtration rate. You really need to lose 90% of it and be down around 5 or 10 before you ever need anything about like dialysis. Now, as you're, if you have chronic kidney disease, as your kidney disease gets worse, that glomerular filtration rate is also going to go down. So if we think about it in relation to the creatinine, so creatinine is going to increase as your kidney gets worse, the glomerular filtration rate is going to decrease. And they go hand in hand because your glomerular filtration rate is calculated from your creatinine. Now we use this glomerular filtration rate to stage chronic kidney disease, really because it's a better measure of kidney function than just looking at a creatinine. So when I talk about the stages of chronic kidney disease, this is what helps me decide, you know, who I need to see more frequently than others, how often I need to get labs. It helps primary care doctors decide who needs to be seen by a nephrologist, all different things. So if I look at chronic kidney disease and the glomerular filtration rate, there are five stages. So someone in stage one, they have a normal glomerular filtration rate. Theirs is above 90, but they probably have a urine test or an ultrasound that shows some abnormality. Maybe they have a ton of protein in their urine or blood in their urine, or maybe they have, uh, their kidney has a bunch of cysts in it. They know that the kidney's not normal because of those tests, but the glomerular filtration rate is normal. Now, most of the time, you know, I don't see people in my clinic until they get about stage three, which is when that glomerular filtration rate is between 30 and 60. Then in stage four, when it's between 15 and 30, that's about whenever I start bringing up the discussion, well, if your kidney function gets worse, um, have you thought about your options for dialysis and transplantation? It doesn't mean we're doing anything, we're just talking about it, because it's better to discuss it now than wait until you know, an emergency happens and we need to do something. Now, in stage five, where the glomerular filtration rate is less than 15, this is where I talk about, um, you know, like most of the time people are starting to get on dialysis and we really have the serious discussion about what their options are um, and what they see themselves doing in the future. Most of the time, people don't need dialysis until they get down to about five or 10%. And that's because at that point, the kidney's not able to do its functions properly. Now, I also look at these stages thinking, well, if I have somebody in stage two or three seeing me in clinic, I'm probably not gonna see them as frequently as somebody in stage five. Maybe somebody in stage two or three, I'll see them like once a year, every six months, where somebody in stage five, I'm gonna see them maybe every month or at most every three months because I need to look out for some of those complications that can happen from chronic kidney disease because they might be losing some of their function.
And I also look at this as who needs labs really. So somebody in stage three might need labs twice a year, where somebody in stage five, they may need them every month. And it's really individualized. I can't tell you everybody in stage five, I'm seeing them every month. It depends on the person individually. So just to talk a little bit about the different causes of kidney disease. So the number one cause in the United States and any developed country is diabetes. It is by far the number one cause. What happens is the high sugars from diabetes actually cause damage to the cells in the kidney and actually cause it a scar. High blood pressures are the number two cause for kidney disease. Those high blood pressures can cause damage to any organ in the the body, you know, high blood pressures can cause strokes, can cause vessel diseases. Well, in the kidney, it, that high pressure causes damage in the kidney that also leads to scarring. Then we have a mixture of a bunch of different causes for kidney disease. So there's something called glomerular nephritis or glomerular nephritides. This is basically where you're attacking your own body. So you're making like antibodies, which you usually use to fight infections, where you actually, you're making them that they're attacking different parts of the kidney and causing damage. So examples would be like IgA nephropathy or membranous nephropathy, um, just to name a few. And like lupus nephritis is another one that can cause damage to any organ in the body, including the kidney. And so for those diseases, there might be medication that can specifically target quieting down the immune system to allow the kidney to heal. Whereas in high blood pressure and diabetes, you have to treat the underlying cause. So diabetes control the diabetes to slow the kidney disease or control the blood pressure to slow the kidney disease. Now there are also some inherited diseases. So probably the most common that you hear about is polycystic kidney disease. And that's really where your kidney is replaced by cyst. Um, and so the kidney gets replaced by cysts, so you don't have little filtering units in the kidney that help clean the blood. Um, another cause for chronic kidney disease is urinary tract obstructions. So the most common that probably we see the most is um, men with prostate problems. So as I mentioned when I was talking about how the structure of the kidney is or how it's laid out in the system, I talked about how the tube going from the bladder out of the body and then goes through the prostate. So if the prostate enlarges, then it actually pinches off that tube and you get urine that kind of backs up all the way to the kidneys. And you know, for women, probably another, for a common one for them would be like a, a uterine fibroids. So having like fibroids in their uterus and that pinching off the ureters or for a diabetics, they might get, they get nerve problems and some of those nerves go into the bladder they're not able to kind of squeeze their bladder and they get a neurogenic bladder, we call it. And so urine kind of backs up. And that's the quickest way to get structural damage to the kidney. If you back up urine all the way to the kidneys, the, you know, the bladder gets big, those ureters going from the bladder to the kidney enlarge, and then it actually starts causing structural damage in the kidney. Another thing that can cause chronic kidney disease is repeated kidney infections. So not urinary tract infections, not infections of the bladder, it actually needs to travel up to the kidney and get something like called pyelonephritis. And that's a kidney infection. Um, and repeated infections to the kidney actually will cause scarring because when you get an infection, your body tries to get rid of it. Um, your white cells go to attack it and get rid of the bacteria and it can also cause damage to the good tissue there. There are also some medications that can cause kidney disease. So, you know, a common over-the-counter ones is like your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So that's like your ibuprofen, Aleve, Motrin, uh, Goodies powder, BC powder. So, you know, those, they were never meant to be taken forever. Like they're really great medicines for inflammation, a little bit of arthritis, but they were never meant to be taken for long-term. So short bursts of like a week or two, you know, to help with whatever problem there is, is okay. But when you take it chronically over years, it can actually cause some scarring in the kidney. Um, some other comments with like antibiotics. There's one common one called vancomycin that really treats um, your methicillin resistant staph aureus or your MRSA infections, which are resistant to a lot of drugs. But it can also, if it gets at high levels, can cause damage to the kidney. So sometimes you have to have that medication, but we just try and minimize it and watch your levels. So now I'm going to kind of get into, well, if I have kidney disease, 
you know, how can it affect the rest of my body? And I'm going to talk about your heart and blood vessels. I'm going to talk about anemia, um, bone damage, malnutrition, and depression. Once we get to progressive kidney failure, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Thevaraja to talk about. So let's talk about kidney disease in your heart and blood vessels. So when you have kidney disease, um, you know, if I compare you to just a general population, a normal healthy person, you're actually at increased risk compared to them for having you know, cardiac disease, so heart problems, strokes, or circulation problems, just by having kidney disease. Now, if you have other things like diabetes, high blood pressure, you know, that's actually going to increase your risk of having heart disease even more. And so what this means is if you came to my clinic and you told me, well, I have, I have like a little chest pain, then I'm going to be like, well, we need to make sure it's not really your heart. You're not having a heart attack. So we might get an EKG to look at your heart. Um, we might, I might, you know, get some blood work to look at your heart. It doesn't mean that you, you're always going to be, it's going to be related to your heart. It very well could be just like heartburn, but I'm going to take it seriously just because you're at high risk for having those problems. So symptoms I take seriously are going to be like chest pain, shortness of breath, you know, for making me think that it might be your heart. You might complain of like pain with walking or wounds that aren't healing if you have circulation problems. Or, you know, if it's a worrisome for a stroke, you might have some neurologic problems, you know, a little weakness or something like that. Now, just to kind of talk a little bit about blood pressure as well. So I mentioned when I talked about normal function of the kidney that the kidneys help respond to, you know, if your blood pressure drops or it's too high. So if your blood pressure is too high, the kidneys, if they're working normally, are going to be like, oh, I need to pee out more salt and water to help lower my blood pressure. Or if my blood pressure is too low, my kidneys are like, oh, they respond to hormones and they're like, I need to hold on to salt and water to raise my blood pressure. When you have kidney disease, sometimes their response to those hormones that help regulate your blood pressure can be off. Maybe I can't get rid of the salt and water as much as I should. And my blood pressure will actually get worse. So it's kind of like a, a vicious cycle, right? So I said that the number two cause is high blood pressure for kidney disease. But then I'm saying that if the kidneys gets worse, that my blood pressure could get worse. And then that cycles back making the kidney function worse. So if you ever come to a kidney doctor, we, we look really closely at your blood pressure and we try to kind of regulate and we have goals for what your blood pressure should be. So a lot of different specialties have goals for blood pressure. So you know, my goals for blood pressure might be a little different than what your general practitioners or your heart doctors. So they're all pretty close. So the one thing that's definitely sure, we do not like blood pressures 150 over 100 or more. We hate those, you know, whether you're a cardiologist or a general practitioner, we don't want those blood pressures. Now, where we differ a little bit is as a kidney doctor, I look at whether you have protein in your urine or not, and that's how I set your blood pressure goal. So if you have a lot of protein in your urine, that tells me that there's probably more damage to your kidney. And I want to hold that, you know, get that blood pressure a little bit better than what I typically would shoot for. So I look for being less than 130 over 80. Now, if you don't have protein in your urine, then I usually let your blood pressure run a little bit higher, like 140s over 90s. And I'm kind of more lenient. I'll say like, you know, if you have protein in your urine, most of them in the 130s over 80s, and you can have like once in a while, 140 over 90 or something. But these blood pressure guidelines change all the time with new studies and new trials. And so, you know, this is just kind of gives you a little bit of guidance for why we say what we do when you see us in clinic. So just moving on. So let's talk about kidney disease and anemia. So what does anemia mean? So that anemia just means low red blood cell count or low hemoglobin or low hematocrit when you look at your labs. And so, you know, if somebody's anemic or they have a low hemoglobin, low hematocrit or low red blood cell count, they might have symptoms of being tired or short of breath or feel like their heart's beating out of their chest or a little dizzy or just no energy. And the reason why I look at it as a kidney doctor is because the kidneys make a hormone called erythropoietin. And this goes to the bone marrow and tells the bone marrow, hey, make red blood cells. So if I have you know, advanced kidney disease, I might not be making as much of that hormone as I should. And so I get a little bit of anemia. So you know, 
everybody's a little different on what level of kidney function it is when their erythropoietin levels start to decrease. Most of the time it's around stage four or five when they start having this anemia from that. So, you know, if you came to my clinic and you said, hey, I've, I've, I'm just feeling really tired all the time and maybe I'm a little bit cold more than usual, I'd be like, okay, you have kidney disease, let's check your blood counts and see if you're anemic. If you're anemic, I don't automatically blame the kidneys and say, oh, it's all because of your kidneys, you're not making enough hormone. What I do is I say, well, let's make sure it's not another cause. Let's, because I don't check erythropoietin levels. They, you know, that test is not standardized. We don't know what re the real normal level is, and it's mainly only used for research. So I rule out other causes, and if all of those are normal, then I say it's probably because of your kidney function. So what are the, some of the other causes? So one thing is having a low iron. And actually in kidney disease, um, you, it's common for patients to have a low iron level. And it's, some of that's because of some of the dietary restrictions that we do. We tell you to eat less red meat and that sort of thing. So you need iron to make red blood cells. So, you know, it just helps make those red blood cells. So if I have somebody who's anemic, then I'm going to check what the, their iron levels to make sure they're adequate. So some other things that I check. So the causes are like, I check your iron level. I check your B12 and your folate level because you also need those to make red blood cells. And then I also want to make sure you're not bleeding. Like, you know, common bleeding that you might not notice would be bleeding in your, like your, your GI tract, your intestinal tract. Um, and so we always want to make sure we rule those out. And primary care doctors are really good about checking those things when they notice anemia. Well, if all of those are normal, then I might say, well, it might be because of your kidney function and your erythropoietin might be low. But if your B12 is low, I give you B12 back. If your folate's low, I give it back to you. Same thing with iron. If your iron's low, I give it back to you in the form of a pill or even iron infusions. Sometimes if people don't tolerate the pills because it causes a little nausea or vomiting or irritates their stomach or really bad constipation, then I do the iron through an IV. And common ones, they would go and get it like maybe once a month, or sometimes I do one that's only two infusions separated by two weeks or seven days. So as I said, if all of these are normal and you're still anemic, and I'm like, well, maybe it's because of your kidneys. Then what I do is I give you back erythropoietin. I give you the synthetic form. It's called erythropoietin stimulating agents. And common ones that we use in clinic are Darbipoietin or Aranesp is the name brand. Now, other ones are EPO, po Procrit, um, Epigen um, that we give. And most of the time, the ones we give in clinic, we'll give it like um, once a month and maybe once every two weeks, kind of depending. Some of them we have to give every other week. It just depends on what type of formula we give and also how you're responding to it. Now, what I monitor if you are getting these medicines is I monitor your hemoglobin on your blood work. And I try to shoot for a range about 10 to 11. I don't shoot for perfect. Like I'm not trying to get into the normal range again because what they found is when they've done it in research with patients with kidney diseases, if they tried to make it perfect by giving you these medicines that you actually increased your risk of uncontrolled blood pressure, blood clots, strokes. So we try to shoot for this 10 to 11. So just to talk a little bit about how your kidneys affect your bones. So let's talk about how the kidney normally handles calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D. So in normal kidney function, the kidneys help, um, they help hold on to calcium, okay? So they try to keep calcium. Now, in normal kidney functions with phosphorus, we have a lot of phosphorus in our diet, and so the kidneys try to pee out a lot of phosphorus to get rid of it. And then in normal kidney function, whenever we have vitamin D, like from our diet or from the sun, it's not the working form. So the kidneys actually activate it into the working form to use calcium and phosphorus and make strong bones. So in kidney disease, what can happen is the calcium might go low because I'm not able to hold on to it like I used to or the phosphorus might go high because I can't get rid of it like I'm supposed to, or I might not be activating that vitamin D. 
Now all of, when phosphorus or calcium or vitamin D all go out of whack, then this can affect a hormone called your parathyroid hormone. Now it's, it's at your neck where your thyroid is, but it doesn't do your metabolism like your thyroid does. It works to make strong bones. So it tells the kidneys, hold on to more calcium or get rid of phosphorus, or it tells the bones, hey, give me more calcium. So anytime those are out of whack, the parathyroid hormone goes out of whack as well, and it usually goes high. And the reason we care about this is because, like I was saying, the parathyroid hormone goes to the bone and says, hey, give me calcium. And after a while, that can put you at risk for fractures and weak bones, kind of almost like an osteoporosis, but not exactly. So what do I look at as a kidney doctor? So if you ask 10 nephrologists or 10 kidney doctors how they manage, you know, um, bone and mineral disease, you'll probably get 10 different answers. But I'm going to give you kind of a general rule of thumb. So if your calcium is low, then I'm going to give you back calcium. So I'm going to give you back calcium in the form of supplements. Like typical one I use is calcium carbonate, which is also known as Tums. Um, if your phosphorus is high, then what I typically do is I tell you to cut back on phosphorus in your diet. Um, if that doesn't work and it's still running high, then I actually will give you something called a phosphorus binder, which basically tells your, it binds your phosphorus in your gut and it goes out through your stool. And common ones that we use are Foslo, calcium acetate, Rinbella. We've even used calcium carbonate or Tums sometimes if we needed to. Um, now, if you're, whenever, we deal with your vitamin D. So I might check your inactive vitamin D or your 25 hydroxylase vitamin D. And if that's low, then I'm gonna supplement it. So I might give you a big loading dose called ergocalciferol. It's like 50,000 units that you take once a week for 12 weeks. Or I might give you something called um, cholecalciferol, which is like 1,000 up to 5,000 that I tell you to take every day to build up that inactive vitamin D. Hopefully when we build it up, then your kidney will start to convert it over into the working form. But if I build it up and it's not in the normal range and, you know, your parathyroid's still out of whack, then I'm going to give you back the active vitamin D. I don't actually check the active vitamin D level because it doesn't really help us and we don't have a standardization for it. So I just assume if the vitamin D is normal and the PT parathyroid hormone is still elevated, then I give you the active vitamin D. And so the most common one that we use in our clinic is calcitriol. Um, other ones that you might hear are Zemplar or Hectorol that we use. Another thing you can do to help keep strong bones is regular exercise, like weight-bearing exercise. Kind of the thing, same thing that they tell people that have osteoporosis. Doing some weight-bearing exercises is really good for your bones. So, you know, if you've had kidney disease, then you might have noticed that we, we try to restrict a lot of things in your diet. Like I just talked about how sometimes if your phosphorus is high, we restrict your phosphorus. Well, if, you're, you know, if your potassium's high, I start restricting your potassium. Um, and then kind of like any patient with kidney disease, we always restrict their sodium intake. And then if you have diabetes, then you might be controlling your carbohydrates. If you have gout, you might be avoiding some red meats. Um, after a while, you run out of stuff to eat. You know, we restrict so much. And so kidney disease patients are at risk for getting malnourished. And so being malnourished, all that means is your body's not able to do its function because it lacks nutrients to do what it's supposed to. And so as a kidney doctor, I realize that, you know, I keep restricting stuff on you, you're not going to have anything to eat. And so usually if I'm restrict, you know, after sodium, if I'm having to restrict potassium and you're having problems or I'm adding something else to restrict, I might send you to a nutritionist because they're really helpful at helping you pick what you can and cannot eat or maximizing what you can eat. Um, and one thing I look on your labs to really um, follow whether you're well nourished or not is your albumin level. So an albumin level normal is about four. It's a type of protein in your blood. Um, if you're malnourished, it would be low. Um, other cases where it can be low is like if you're losing a lot of protein in your urine. So I take that into account as well. And the, re the reason why I care is because if you're malnourished, you don't do as well. You, you have poor wound healing. You're more prone for infections. If, you have, if you're malnourished when you start dialysis, you don't do as well on dialysis. So I, I really do want um, you to be as well nourished as possible. 
And so a lot of times I'll tell people, you know, do a food diary. Track what you're eating just to see where your hidden sodium is or your hidden potassium is that you're taking in. You know, know your labs. Know what your sodium, your potassium, you know, your phosphorus levels are. Work with the nutritionist or the dietitian. Um, there are several that are specific for kidney disease or focus on kidney disease, and so they're very helpful in um, picking out what you can and cannot eat and maximizing what you can. So I want to talk a little bit about depression. So depression is not caused by kidney disease, but they're often seen together. Because if you think about it, I was telling you, you have to lose 90% of your function before you ever get symptoms. And so if patients have other medical problems, diabetes, high blood pressure, and then on their labs, all of a sudden now they have kidney disease, it's one more like burden that they have to deal with. And the first thing they think of is, oh, I'm going to be on dialysis. And that's not always the case. And so sometimes it can, people can, when they're diagnosed with kidney disease or have had it for a while, or if they're restricting tons of things in their diet, they can actually start to develop depression symptoms, such as like sadness, being irritable, um, sleeping a lot, not sleeping at all, um, loss of interest in things they used to enjoy, um, just kind of feeling like they're giving up or they're overwhelmed. And so we work really closely with their primary care doctors. So you know, if I have a patient that, you know, I just kind of, I, I typically just kind of chit chat with them whenever they come into their visit. You know, what, have, what vacations have you gone on? What have you done lately? And if I get a sense that they're starting to be depressed, I kind of talk to them about that and I actually reach out to their primary care doctor so that they can follow up on it. And treatments for depression are, you know, medications, counseling, and really the combination of both is very helpful. And we work closely with the primary care doctor to help pick medications that um, won't affect your kidneys. So I'm gonna switch it over to Dr. Thevaraja now. All right, so I, my part is to review a little bit about what to do, uh, how we manage uh, kidney disease when it gets to a certain level or when we get to end stage kidney disease or end stage kidney failure. So um, waste when it builds up to a toxic level in the bloodstream is what we call uremia. And uremia is an indication of having kidney failure. And at that point, it just means the kidneys can no longer compensate and you're starting to get more symptoms from the kidneys not cleaning out those waste products. And in those cases, treatment is either things like dialysis or kidney transplantation. Now, as Dr. Nicely was talking about, at first you really don't have any symptoms of kidney issues. So you need to lose about 90% of your kidney function. But everybody's kidney disease is unique in that not everybody will have the, all of these symptoms. Some of them may have one symptom, some may not have any of them, and it's just by lab work that we know that their kidney function is getting worse. But symptoms can include worsening of swelling in the hands and feet and face, having fatigue, having shortness of breath, trouble concentrating, a change in your appetite, uh, cramping, uh, itchiness of the skin, a change in the amount you're urinating, worsening blood pressure, or damage to the bones. And so what we as physicians and your healthcare team are wait, you know, relying on you is to tell us if something's different for you, because that's giving us a clue as, as to whether or not something has changed. A key thing to note is that there really are not any medications designed to reverse the damage to the kidneys. Our goal when we're treating someone is to see what we can do to slow down the progression. And there's really no kidney specific medications. Medications that we prescribe can be divided up into two categories. One, to help manage the risk factors that can speed up kidney damage. So if you have high blood pressure, your blood pressure medications are helping out with management of your kidney disease. If you have high blood sugars, diabetes medications will help us out in terms of managing or the impact on the kidneys. And then there are other medications that we prescribe when somebody has complications that are related to kidney damage. So if you're getting into trouble with swelling, things like diuretics or water pills. If someone is anemic, medications like iron or the medications to help you build up blood cells. If someone's vitamin D deficient, all of those medications are, are designed to treat the complications of kidney damage. 
Now, regardless of the cause of kidney issues or the level of kidney function, there are some general recommendations that we have for everyone. And they help us in terms of taking some of the workload off of the kidneys. There's some general dietary recommendations. One of the key ones is really watching the salt or sodium in your diet, aiming for less than two grams or two and a half grams per day. The other thing is to really cut down on the amount of processed food and sugar. These are all chemicals that your body just has to get rid of. So if your kidneys are already under stress, it kind of makes sense putting more of those uh, chemicals into your system is just more workload for the kidneys. Now, sometimes people are put on special dietary restrictions in terms of potassium and phosphorus. Those are not because those are damaging to the kidneys. It's just at a certain level of kidney function, you may not be getting rid of as much potassium or phosphorus. And so instead of already overworking the kidneys when you've already built up a high load of those agents, we might ask you to restrict them in your diet but everyone's kidney function levels are different and everyone's course of kidney disease is different. So you can have two people with the same GFR level, but they both may not have potassium issues. So just because you haven't been placed on a potassium or phosphorus restriction doesn't mean that you automatically have to start that because we do all need a certain amount of potassium and we do all need a certain amount of phosphorus. If you are told, it's gonna to be based on your lab work. And if you're told to restrict potassium, it's gonna be looking at foods like potatoes and tomatoes, bananas, orange juice. These, it, this does not mean you're not gonna be able to eat any of these items. It's just gonna be that you're gonna cut down on the total amount of servings per week. Phosphorus is in dairy products and meat. Luckily, that type of organic phosphorus in, in real foods is not as big of a problem as opposed to the phosphorus that we might get from prepackaged foods and that are in preservative agents. So luckily, if you're sticking more with the actual food, you're probably not gonna get into as much problem with the phosphorus. Another uh, common uh, thing that we discuss with uh, uh, people who have kidney issues is to work on watching the amount of protein in their diet. We've gotten into a bad habit of really having large portion sizes and we don't need as much protein as we typically might be getting in a serving size. So we want enough protein in our diet to be able to maintain our muscle mass, prevent malnutrition, to uh, maintain our immune system and maintain our daily energy level but any excess amount is just more that our kidneys have to get rid of. So a rough rule of thumb or a visual cue is for if you're eating things like chicken, beef, pork, lamb, for men, a size of a deck of cards is a serving size um, per meal. For women, about the size of the palm of your hand. If you're having a less dense protein like fish, about the size of a television remote control. And that's a rough visual cue for that. Now, if somebody is recu recuperating from a major surgery, a major hospitalization, your doctors might tell you to increase the amount of protein to help you in that recovery phase. Water intake is another big question we get in terms of dietary management. There's no specific amount of water unless you have a history of kidney stones. If somebody has a history of kidney stones, we're aiming to have someone drink about two to two and a half liters of water a day to prevent further kidney stones. Otherwise, you want to drink for your thirst and make sure you're getting enough fluid in your system to prevent dehydration. A rough uh, way of knowing if you have enough fluid in your system is your urine should be clear to almost a very pale yellow. If it's very dark yellow, it means it's more concentrated and you're behind on fluids. Water is a better choice than some of the other fluids because it doesn't have preservatives, it doesn't have sugar, it doesn't have salt in it. Okay, but you don't have to force yourself to drink a specific amount of water per day. And really, if you have any questions about what you should be doing for your diet, um, working with your doctor and reviewing your lab work will help give you some guidance there. Another key thing to remember is no one can look at you and know that you have any kidney issues. And so really, you're the best person to be your advocate for your own health care, and let people know that you have kidney issues. A lot of us go to a lot of different uh, physicians or um, different health care providers for things like orthopedic surgeons for knee problems or hip problems or 
maybe an oral surgeon because you need a tooth removed. If you don't tell these individuals that you have kidney issues, they may be prescribing medications or imaging studies that may not be safe for your level of kidney function. Also, thinking about the situation where people are going to urgent care clinics in the middle of the night, um, they don't routinely check labs. So unless you mention that you have kidney issues, they may not double check certain things. There are certain imaging studies, CAT scans with um, IV contrast or angiograms or MRIs with IV contrast that may cause some problems when people have kidney issues. Sometimes these are necessary studies and there's the only way to get a diagnosis or clarify what's going on is to use these studies. If we need to absolutely use these studies, then we'll take some precautions in terms of reducing the amount of contrast or working with the team to do other uh, things such as giving you IV fluids, making sure you're not dehydrated to minimize the exposure there. Keeping on top of your medications, knowing that all, some of these interactions can be harmful to the kidney function is also important. Even if you don't know the exact creatinine level, if you know the rough ballpark of where your GFR is, that can help a lot of people when they're prescribing medications or rec recommending things. Be very careful with some of the over-the-counter medications. Medications like Motrin, Advil, Aleve, Dr. Nicely had mentioned earlier, were never designed to be taken on a long-term basis and may be more harmful if people have more advanced kidney issues. Also, simple agents like uh, milk of magnesia or preparations for colonoscopy, certain ones are safe in people with kidney disease, other ones are not. If you're ever concerned about it, you can always double check with your pharmacist or your uh, primary care physician. So when we look at when we get end-stage kidney disease or when our kidneys fail, we have to figure out a way to replace that function. And so there are two major categories and also a third option in terms of how we replace that. One is dialysis, so we find another way of cleaning the blood or filtering the blood transplantation where someone gets a new kidney. And then briefly we'll mention conservative measures where individuals may not pursue dialysis or transplantation because of other health issues. And we treat them with all the same medications and all of the other treatments. We just don't prepare them for dialysis or transplant. So what does dialysis mean? It basically means we have to find a way other than the kidneys to remove the waste and extra fluid from your blood when the, your kidneys are no longer able to. There are two major types. There's hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Hemodialysis, we're using a machine. Our blood, we have a way of getting the blood from the individual into the machine. The machine cleans the blood and returns the cleaned blood back to the person and peritoneal dialysis where we take advantage of the fact that we all have a thin lining of tissue inside our abdomen which can be used as a filter to help uh, clean the blood. Now both types of dialysis do require surgery for an access to be able to do these dialysis treatments. Neither type of dialysis is better than the other so both of them will require some planning, some you know evaluation as to whether or not someone's a good candidate for one type or another but the more important part is to find the one that you're comfortable with and what suits your lifestyle best because you're going to get good outcomes with both types. So the first category or first uh, group is hemodialysis. So we're using a machine to filter or clean your blood. Now this can happen in two different ways. It can happen either at home and the picture that you are seeing on your left um, is a picture of a home hemodialysis machine. As you can see, it's on the smaller side. It's designed to be portable. It's not designed with any uh, special plumbing hookups or things along that line. On the right-hand side of your screen, you're seeing what we call an in-center hemodialysis machine. Now, this is a larger machine. It would require special plumbing. It requires a technician or a nurse to run the machine. And this is the type of machine you would see in a dialysis unit when you would come to an outpatient center three times a week or if you were in the hospital setting. Base, and this is a picture that looks at, shows you what the setup is for hemodialysis, whether it's the in-center machine 
or the home dialysis machine. So it, in, as you can see from the picture, there's a gentleman who's got two lines in his arm. One line is drawing the blood. The blood goes into a dial to the dialysis machine and into something called a dialyzer, which is sort of an artificial filter or an artificial kidney. That filter pulls out the waste products and those waste products, the extra salt, the extra water, the um, all of the other waste products that the kidneys are trying to remove goes down the drain. And then the cleaned blood goes back into the individual. So the first step is figuring out how do you get the blood from the person to the machine. And so there are three, uh, there's something called a hemodialysis access. And on this screen, you're seeing uh, three different uh, pictures and we'll go through each of these before we show you some of the models here. Now, the first one at the top of the screen is something called a fistula. And basically, it's a connection between your own artery and vein, so there's no artificial material in there. And it takes about six to 12 weeks before being ready. Both the fistula and graft are both considered outpatient procedures. They typically take about 30 minutes. These procedures are performed by a vascular surgeon. They usually are same-day surgery, but because it's your own artery and your own vein, there's a significant amount of time that needs to be uh, built in for us to refer you to a vascular surgeon, have you evaluated, have you set up for the surgery, have you had the surgery, and then before it's ready to use. And when we say it takes six to 12 weeks for that uh, vein to be, be ready, it means it takes six to 12 weeks for that vein to be uh, getting that blood flow from the artery and stretching to be big enough to be able to do a dialysis treatment. Okay. Now, initially after the surgery, you'll have stitches in the arm. The, once those sutures or stitches are removed, you won't have anything outside of the body, and all of the, the fistula itself is underneath the skin surface. Now, some people have veins that are small or have been damaged over the years from other health problems, or maybe they had chemotherapy, or maybe they've just always had very small veins. And in those cases, we use some synthetic material to create what we call a shunt instead, and this is called a graft. Now, because the graft is already designed to be the right size and already big enough to support dialysis, the, the time from when you have the surgery to when it can be used is a lot shorter, and usually it's from the, um, on the order of days to weeks. The decision as to whether or not someone gets a fistula or a graft is really dependent on their own, how their own veins look. So when they are seeing the vascular surgeon for that first visit, it's a consultation where they examine their veins in the arms, they might do an ultrasound, and that's the way they can decide about whether a fistula or a graft is suitable. Now, both of those are better options because once you've had the surgery and recuperated from the surgery, those are lower risk of infection than the last um, type of access that's on the page there. And at the bottom of the page, you're seeing what we call a catheter. And this is a specialized larger IV line that's placed in uh, either radiology or by surgery, and it can be used right away. So this is really our option if mm -hmm. I need to get dialysis right away and I don't have time to get a fistula or a graft placed. Now, um, it has to be a larger IV and go into one of the major veins in the neck, um, and the tip of that goes down to the level of the heart. The reason why it has to be a bigger IV than the tiny ones that we may have in our arms if you've been in the hospital before is remember, the kidneys need a lot of blood flow to work. To be able to clean the blood effectively, we need a bigger IV to be able to clean the amount of blood that we need to. And now I'm going to switch back so I can actually show you some of the models um, for, uh, that we're talking about. Okay, so the first one is our model of the catheter. And key part of that is you can see that this little blue portion here. This, from this little blue portion to these pieces here are outside of the body. And so this is why we always are a little wary of someone having a catheter for a long period of time, because there is an increased risk of infection. No matter how well we take care of it, how well we keep the bandage on there, 
there's always a potential of some bacteria getting in through the skin and traveling along this catheter. Now, as you can see, the tip of this catheter all goes all the way down into the level of the heart. So this is another reason why we really worry about infection risk because not only is it an infection that goes in the bloodstream, it can go down to the level of the heart and cause a serious issue. So if I had this type of catheter, typically when it's, when it's placed in the hospital for you to leave, we are placing it underneath the collarbone. So that way it's underneath your shirt and you won't see it during the daytime. There are two pieces, a red and a blue port. One is for the blood to be pulled and one is for the blood to be returned. When you come in for a dialysis treatment, the nurses are cleaning around the site, they're changing the dressing, and, and then uh, in between you're trying not to get that dressing wet or that exit site wet because that's another potential source of infection. But if we needed to absolutely need to start dialysis right away, we could get this placed and be starting you on dialysis within a couple of minutes after. Now another type of dialysis access is the fistula and the graft. And so this is an arm that has a, that's a model for both the fistula and the graft. As you can tell, there's nothing outside of the body. And that's one of the benefits with the fistula and the graft in terms of minimizing that risk of infection. Because once you get through the original surgery and all the stitches are removed, there's nothing outside. Now, when you would come in for dialysis, what they would do is just like when they're drawing blood, they would put a tourniquet on and the vein, which is the piece of the fistula or the graft would kind of pop up more towards the skin surface. And then they would put the needles in. They would put one needle in to draw the blood, one needle to return the blood. The needles would stay in during the entire dialysis session. At the end of the treatment, the needles would be removed You'd have pressure put on there for about five to 10 minutes. You'd have some small bandages. After about three to four hours, those bandages can be removed. Because nothing is outside of the body, the infection risk is much lower. So you're not worried. You can be getting in the shower. You can get, be getting into the tub. You can be swimming and not worry about uh, having an infection get into your dialysis access. There are some restrictions that people will have immediately after the surgery. You will be wearing a bandage on there until the stitches all come out. The other piece is because there's, we don't want to damage the fistula or graft, you won't be doing blood draws or having any um, blood pressures on that arm where the access is. So um, when we talk about hemodialysis, we're talking about in-center hemodialysis and home hemodialysis. So the process that would happen in the dialysis unit is the treatments are performed by a medical staff. The treatments are typically three days a week for about three to four hours. Your specific prescription will depend on what your body size is and um, what your labs look like and how much urine output you still have. When you go into the unit, you are weighed at the beginning of the treatment and you're weighed at the end of the treatment. That's how we figure out how much fluid has been removed. Your blood pressure, heart rate, and temperature are checked at the start of the treatment and then monitored every 15 to 30 minutes during the course of the treatment. Now blood work is gonna be checked at the dialysis unit uh, at least once a month for some um, specific tests like your nutrition levels and then other things are gonna be checked on a weekly basis. So that'll save you some time for going for some of the routine lab work. Also some of the medications that um, you are receiving for managing complications of kidney disease, like the vitamin D medications for anemia will now be given during the dialysis treatment. You'll be seeing your physician or the uh, team that's working with the physician one to four times a month during the, during the course. So you're not going to the office for separate uh, visits anymore. The downside is there is a set schedule. You'll have an appointment time, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 10 a.m. Now, if you need to make arrangements for different, for conflicts in your schedule, if we can plan ahead, we can always switch out a treatment or switch the time of that. Now, because the treatments are three times a week, there are days where you're not getting dialysis, so we do have to be watching the diet a little bit closer and the fluid intake a little bit closer 
for those days that you're not receiving a dialysis treatment. Now, home hemodialysis is performed at home typically by you and a partner, though there are uh, centers and clinics that are now starting to do more solo training. The sessions can be anywhere between four to six days a week for about two to three hours. Remember again, your prescription is going to be defined based on your size, based on how your lab work is looking, and how much residual kidney function you have. Training can take about four to eight weeks, and the training is usually coming in Monday through Friday for several hours at a time. The training process will start with basically you being walked through the setup learning how to take your vital signs, including your temperature, blood pressure, and your heart rate, how to weigh yourself, how to stick yourself. And during this training period, you're gonna be going through this process over and over again. Now, just because we hit the eight week mark doesn't mean we say, okay, you're, you know, it's been eight weeks, you need to go home and figure out the rest on your own. We don't get you out of training until, we, until your comfort level is there for being able to run the process. You aren't purchasing this machine. You're training on the machine that you will then be taking home. The machine is released to you, plus the uh, supplies are released to you once you've been signed off on the training. Now, in terms of what your partner may would be learning, they don't need to learn the full extent of all of the different pieces of the training. Their training is mainly focused on being able to take you off the machine and troubleshooting. Some partners may learn a little bit more. Some partners may learn the minimum. It really depends on uh, your own situation. Once you're done with the training process and then you take the machine home, there will be a home visit just to see you do the entire process and make sure that you're comfortable with that process. And then after that, you'll be following up in the clinic about one to two times a month for a check-in with the nurse and the uh, physician. Sometimes those visits may be spaced out once things are a little bit more stable, but you will be coming in at least once a month. Now the downside is you do need space at home for the equipment and for the supplies. Also, so if someone's in the process of moving to another location or is not in, a, not in their permanent uh, home, this is not the time to be starting a home dialysis modality. There is a bit of a burden on the partner especially if the partner is working, trying to coordinate the times. The benefits are that your schedule is a little bit up to you in terms of when you're doing uh, the treatments. And also you will all have access 24 hours a day to a on-call dialysis nurse and physician as needed. The other type of dialysis is peritoneal dialysis. And this takes advantage of the fact that we all have a thin layer of tissue inside of our abdomen, which acts as a filter and can, uh, because of the amount of small, tiny blood vessels that are in there. We use a special fluid called dialysate, which is piped in and out of the abdomen um, throughout the course of the day or over a night, depending on if you're using the cycler. And this type of treatment only takes place at home. So there's no type of uh, center that somebody would go to to do, to do the peritoneal dialysis. And in the pictures that you're seeing on the bottom of the screen, it shows you the two uh, types of the peritoneal dialysis. One is the CAPD or the manual exchanges, and that's the picture of the woman sitting in the chair. There's no additional equipment. The bags are dra draining into the, into the abdomen with, via gravity when you're ready to drain out the fluid that's been sitting in the abdomen, you put a, you attach to a bag and let that bag on, rest on the floor and the fluid drains into that. And then the picture in the middle is a, is a, a picture of somebody using the cycler where they're doing the treatments at night and a machine is doing those exchanges. This picture on the screen that you're seeing here is a picture of the peritoneal dialysis catheter, and we'll show you a model in a, in a minute. This catheter is placed about one month prior to needing uh, dialysis. This is also an outpatient procedure. It's either done by interventional radiology or surgeons. It takes about two to four weeks to heal up before you can use it. 
at about two weeks, the PD nurses are flushing the catheter and they're starting training. About four weeks, you can fully use the catheter. So this is our model of a PD catheter. And as you can see, there, there's a significant portion of the catheter that's outside of the body. So there is a potential risk for infection. Most people will have the catheter sort of coiled up. It'll either be underneath a gauze um, with tape, or they might be using like a cloth belt to kind of hold it in place so it's not getting infected. When the catheter is not in use, it can be coiled up like that just against the skin surface. Now, because of its location, you can tell and, the poten and where it goes into the skin and the fact that it goes into the skin, there are potential risks for infection if you are soaking in a tub, uh, soaking in fresh water. So those types of activities are not possible. Salt water is fine for, from that standpoint. So uh, in this picture, it's showing you a setup of how the P a peritoneal dialysis exchanges happen. So on the top right hand of the screen, you see a bag of fluid called dialysate. That fluid is then, you, un, you release the clamps, that fluid is then draining into the abdomen through that catheter, that peritoneal catheter that we just uh, saw. The fluid then sits in the abdomen for a period of time, depending on what someone's prescription is, it can be three hours, it can be up to six hours. All the waste products, the extra salt, the water, all of that gets pulled into that fluid. When it's time to drain, you hook the catheter up to another bag, you unclamp it, and all that fluid will then drain out to that bag that's in the bottom of the screen. Um, and that would be the, the waste product from that. So with the peritoneal dialysis, because it doesn't have a direct access to blood, it's often, it can be performed at home by just an individual. They don't need a partner for training or for doing the treatments. Uh, the training itself can take about two to six weeks. You learn how to check your weight, blood pressure, and determine how to do the combination of the different peritoneal fluids to get the amount of extra fluid off of you and to do the amount of uh, dialysis exchanges. Now there are several different variations. Some people are doing what we call the manual exchanges where there's uh, no specific machine, or machine involved. It's all the exchanges are occurring by gravity and they take about three to five times a day, 30 minutes per exchange. Some people are doing the cycler at night, which is that picture that's in the bottom of the screen there where they're doing about eight to 10 hours at nighttime. Some people are doing a combination of both. It really depends on what their lab work is showing and how well they're able to clear the toxins. Once you're completed the training, the machine would also go to your home as well as the supplies. You're continuing to follow up with the doctor about one to two times a month. Also in this scenario, you are not purchasing the machine. The machine is owned by the uh, dialysis unit and it's given to you for use. That way you don't have to worry about maintenance and don't, don't have to uh, be concerned about uh, if there are problems with the machine, it will just get swapped out. Uh, now, because this is considered life-saving treatment, both this type of machine, the cycler in the bottom of that picture and in the home hemodialysis machine are both of them need to be accommodated if you are traveling. So those are either traveling in the cabin with you versus being shipped uh, ahead of time. Now, if someone is traveling ahead of time and wants to continue their home dialysis or their peritoneal dialysis, they would kind of coordinate to take their machine with them and then coordinate having their supplies sent on ahead to where they're traveling. Additionally, we've had some individuals when they're traveling decide that they don't want to deal with their home equipment. And in the setting of home hemodialysis, we could then send, set them up temporarily at an in-center unit. So who's not a candidate for peritoneal dialysis? Because it involves that lining on the inside of their abdomen, individuals who've had a lot of abdominal surgery where they've maybe built up a lot of scar tissue, are they may not 
have tissue that's good enough to be a filter anymore. If someone has a VP shunt, there are, uh, are situations where people have built up fluid around their brain and have a special shunt that drains that fluid into their abdomen. Because of the risk of infection, we can't do peritoneal dialysis. If someone's had an abdominal cancer, there's a concern that perhaps that could irritate or spread some cells that way. Or if someone has liver disease with a complication of ascites where they build up a lot of fluid in their abdomen, they may not be able to tolerate getting another two to two and a half liters of fluid um, from the peritoneal dialysis put into their abdomen. So these are situations where we would probably say peritoneal dialysis is not an option for somebody. So how do you choose? It really is based on what suits your lifestyle. You can transition from one type of dialysis to another. Um, it does take some planning, but you shouldn't feel as though you once you make a decision, that's the route that you will have to go down uh, continuously. And I think that would also reduce some of the stress that people are under when they're deciding about uh, dialysis modalities. Additionally, there might be times in your life where in-center might be a better option than the home dialysis one. You know, I gave you the scenario earlier of somebody who's in the middle of transitioning from one home to another or transitioning from one state to another. That's not the time to be uh, trying to do home dialysis. You might need to do in-center for a period of time. Um, really, the most important thing is finding out what you're most comfortable with and you know that's the one you're going to be most successful with because it's going to be easier for you to stick to. The other type of treatment when we talk about end-stage kidney disease is a kidney transplant. And really, we're, your kidneys are effectively being replaced by a new kidney. The new kidney either comes from a live donor or a deceased donor. To maintain that transplant, you'll be taking medications for the rest of your life to prevent your body from reacting to that new kidney. Our body's immune system is designed to always fight infections. And one of the ways it does that is by looking at the different cells and seeing if they match all of the other cells in your body. When they notice cells that don't match, like a transplanted organ, they might attack that thinking it's an infection. And so the medications that people are taking at the time of transplantation and for years after are designed to fool their immune system or suppress their immune system enough to allow them to keep that transplant. In this picture here, the other reason we included this picture is it lets you know that um, the kidney transplant is not going to go where your original kidneys are. So in the middle of the picture are your two kidneys that are in the middle portion of your back. Your transplanted kidney will go in the lower abdomen and it'll be connected to the blood vessels that supply the leg. So um, that way it's easier to scan, um, to get an ultrasound and monitor after a transplant. Also, um, the surgery is already four hours by placing it in this location. If we try to go at, to the original site of your kidneys, we might be adding several more hours onto it. The other key thing to remember is we're not removing your original kidneys. Um, unless you, somebody has a history of kidney cancer, chronic kidney infections, or kidneys that have gotten so large they're crowding out the rest of the tissue in the abdomen, there really isn't a reason to remove those kidneys. Now the transplant evaluation uh, visit is designed to be a visit where you're meeting with multiple people the nephrologist, the surgeon, the transplant coordinator, the social worker, the dietitian, to see if you're a good candidate. Each one of those team members is doing a separate portion of the evaluation. You know, and you can start this process once your GFR is less than 20. So most people are not needing dialysis until their GFR is less than 10. This is allowing you to start this process of working up for a transplant earlier with the hope that maybe some people can be transplanted before they would ever need dialysis or that you've built up a lot of time on the transplant list before you ended up on dialysis. 
after that evaluation appointment, you'd be starting on testing. Some of the testing is to look at how you're going to do during surgery. So it's focused on what your heart function is. So it might be a stress test. It might be an echocardiogram. If you already have a cardiologist, they might ask for uh, or a consultation with your cardiologist. It'll be looking at your lung function. Do you have um, chronic lung issues? Do you need chronic oxygen support? All of those things are going to be looked at. And then it's about making sure people are caught up on their age-appropriate cancer screening. A lot of people, because they get caught up in their other health problems, maybe have missed their mammogram for several years or maybe haven't gotten their colonoscopy. This is about getting all of that testing caught up because we don't want to be causing more problems with the medications that we give somebody to suppress their immune system. Plus, we don't want them to get into other health problems where we might have to which would complicate their transplant course. Once somebody is considered medically clear, the committee approves you to be listed. Then we send a formal notification to the United Network of Organ Sharing and you get officially placed on the list. Now, one question people have is, where is my local, what, what position am I on the list? There's not really a specific position that you have. It's based on how long you've been listed for. Whenever a kidney comes up, it first first we look at what the blood type is. So if a kid if you have a B blood type and an A A blood type kidney becomes available, it's going to be offered to those people on the wait list who have an A blood type who would be a good match for that. Okay. Now, once you're listed, you're basically waiting for a call. The average wait time is about two and a half to three years on the East Coast. It's closer to five years for a B or an O blood type. On the West Coast, uh, those times are a little bit longer. It can be on the order of seven to 10 years. The other category of when, how we manage end-stage kidney disease is conservative measures. Some choose not to pursue dialysis or kidney transplant because they have incurable cancers, they have other end organ disease, um, they may have maybe due to personal preference. We treat them with all the same medications for as long as possible. It doesn't mean that we're not treating the individual, it just means that we're not sending them for a surgery for a fistula and it, doesn't, and it means we're not sending them for a transplant evaluation. So there's some key things for you to do, um, you know, coming out of this presentation and when you're working with your doctor, you know, this presentation is designed to give you an overview, to help spark some conversations between you and your doctor, and to kind of take those next steps in terms of learning about more information uh, as it applies to your health. Things that you can do, helping monitoring your progress by tracking your labs, Real, learning your medications and knowing what you're taking them for, and really remaining engaged with the healthcare team. And on this last page here, we have um, a couple of different websites that have more information. Um, I'd like to highlight the one with the National Kidney Foundation, kidney.org. They have a couple of programs uh, with peer mentors, so individuals, who have gone through the transplant process, individuals who've gone through the dialysis process, home dialysis training, and have been who can be peer mentors. So sometimes it's helpful to hear from somebody who's actually gone through the surgery for a fistula versus just hearing from the vascular surgeon or the nephrologist about that. Um, there are other in, there's the other websites provide information about diet and different. Um, um, recipe items. There's information about how to navigate the transplant process. So all of these are great websites to look at. Um, if you're looking at stuff on the internet, sticking to .gov or .org websites are your safer bets because this is um, standard material that uh, has been uh, reviewed uh, in the past. So uh, we hope this is helpful for you, and we hope you look uh, you come and join us for our other programs. Thank you.